Uh, I'm Tom Landy, uh, and I'm happy to be able to say for the first time in a public setting that uh, I'm the director of the Michael C. McFarland SJ, Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. That was announced uh, this weekend, uh, an event with some, uh, some donors here, and uh, was a lovely event. And to me, it's a great honor, really, to have Father McFarland's name uh, attached to our center. It raises the bar high, keeps the bar up there in terms of the sort of work that we have to do. Uh, I'm not going to introduce our speaker tonight. I'm going to introduce the person who's introducing the speaker, which I usually don't like, except it was my first chance to welcome everyone to the McFarland Center, and I wanted to do that. Frederick Chichavachki, the philosopher who heads Peace and Conflict Studies, uh, and has brought this together tonight with us, is going to introduce uh, Nira Skipitz. Thank you, Tom. I love introducing speakers. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking about writing to Father McFarland if he can change my job description so that my main and only job is just to introduce speakers on campus. I think I'll be busier that way than, than by teaching my classes. Uh, jokes aside, it's a real pleasure to introduce Nir Isakovich to you, a person I've known for a number of years and a person from whom I've learned a lot, uh, not just about Israel, but about many other issues as well. Um, here are a few things you should know about Nir Isaacovitz. He teaches um, legal and political philosophy at Suffolk University in Boston, where he also co-founded and, and uh, still directs graduate program in ethics and public policy. He received his PhD fr uh, from Boston University, where he says he was fortunate to work under David Lyons, and before that he studied law in Israel. <coughs> His research is mostly focused on how countries emerge from war and what happens once the fighting is over. Um, his book, Sympathizing with the Enemy, was recently published by Brill and Republic of Letters. It provides a philosophical account on political reconciliation. <coughs> uh, there was recently a symposium on a book and a panel discussion that are uh, available on the web. Currently, he's writing a new book about uh, on truces and ceasefire. What does it mean to establish a truce, something that we don't pay much attention to because our logic is usually either or. Either we have a war or we have a peace, and yet there are a lot of things in between. Um, so Nir Azakovich is going to talk to us about the uh, current situation in Israel, some of the conflicts with, uh, with the neighboring countries, the tensions that exist over there. So please welcome uh, Nir Isakovich. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me? I have my Lady Gaga microphone, so I'm especially proud of that. And I have nobody to introduce. And the climate is like my native Israel, so I feel very much at home. Um, Thank you very much, Pedro, for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, it's a big honor to talk to you guys tonight. What I'd like to do is um, two things, and uh, you can follow me um, on your handouts. The first thing is to try to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, where Israel finds itself after this tumultuous year in the Middle East, uh, and it doesn't find itself in a particularly good place. And the other thing uh, in the second part is how it can possibly, uh, what some ideas might be for it to find itself in a somewhat better place. So Israel is, um, does everybody have the handout by the way? Okay. So Israel is in a pretty precarious shape uh, right now. In fact, uh, I'm 39 years old, and I was born in 72. In 72. Uh, it's probably in the most precarious shape that I remember it being. Well, I don't remember anything from 1974, but it probably is in the most precarious shape that it's been in since the 1973 war. Um, why is that? Well, let's, let's, let's survey uh, the neighborhood for a little bit. Uh, the Arab Spring, uh, the wave of anti-authoritarian demonstrations in the Arab world um, that we uh, have witnessed this year uh, has unseated a government in Egypt that has had a peace agreement uh, with Israel since 1979. 
Uh, that government was very bad for the Egyptians, less bad uh, as far as the Israelis were concerned for their own uh, national interest. There's a provisional military government in place in Egypt, and it promised to bring about elections in the next few months in three stages. One in November for the lower house of parliament, two more for the second house of parliament next year. Then once the two houses of parliament in Egypt will be in place, the idea is to elect a smaller um, constitutional body that would draw up a constitution, then to bring that to a referendum, and once the constitution is approved by a referendum, to uh, elect a president. Now, the worry as far as the Israelis are concerned is that um, a lot of things might happen in the meantime, and mainly the worry is who would win uh, who would win the election. Uh, there's a very strong uh, Islamic Brotherhood uh, contingent uh, in Egypt. Islamic uh, Brotherhood is a relatively um, more militant version of uh, political Islam. And uh, regardless of that, there's also a worry about whether, a separate worry, probably a worry that Egyptians have more than Israelis about how serious the transitional military government in Egypt is about um, giving up power. Just in this last week, there were riots by the Copts, uh, the Coptic minority in Egypt, which is the Christian minority uh, in Egypt, about uh, their own persecution, and 24 of them were killed by um, government troops shooting into the crowd and uh, running them over with uh, armored personnel carriers. Um, Specifically, what Israel is worried about is that the 30-something year stability in its southern border with Egypt is going to disappear. And there have been some worrying signs uh, in that direction. For example, in the last few weeks or the last few months, Egypt seems to have lost control over the Sinai Desert that separates Egypt and Israel as a sort of buffer zone. And as a direct result of that, there was an infiltration of um, a, a terrorist unit into uh, southern Israel, and several Israelis were killed on a, in an attack um, on a road. Example number two, the Israeli embassy in Cairo was stormed uh, by an angry Egyptian mob, and the Israeli uh, diplomatic staff was all evacuated back to Israel, including uh, the ambassador. On the plus side, is Egypt has been instrumental in brokering uh, this deal, the prisoner exchange deal that some of you may have heard on heard about on the news, uh, in which one Israeli prisoner will be exchanged for 1,027 uh, prisoners and uh, Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons. So the first piece of the puzzle is that there's a great deal, uh, one way or another, any way you look at it, there's a great deal of um, uncertainty about how stable Israel's border with Egypt will be and whether or not it will have to once again divert resources to make sure that that border is secure. The other piece of the puzzle is that Israel and Jordan, and this is uh, going down on your handout, have had a peace agreement, a formal peace agreement since 1994. Jordan has a Hashemite monarch. Hashemites are a small Bedouin tribe uh, that rules over a Palestinian majority. So it's a minority uh, government. Um, that's a government that has also been destabilized by the recent wave of democratic uprisings. Um, in response, the Hashemites have been a little bit more nimble than the rest of their neighbors. They've uh, essentially tried to bribe their people into being quiet somewhat successfully. They've increased government subsidies. They've increased uh, public sector salaries. Um, but Jordan has been another friend of Israel who is now becoming uh, destabilized. If what you're hearing is that Israel's interests were aligned with authoritarian uh, regimes, you're hearing correctly. So at this point, I'm just trying to give as factual uh, a presentation as I can of how the Israelis see their um, self-interest. The third piece of the puzzle, uh, perhaps in some ways most significant so far, is the destabilizing of Israel's uh, alliance with Turkey. Turkey is seen to be the other 
democracy, the other substantively, substantively democratic uh, state in the Middle East, and has for years um, been very close to Israel, has had a lot of political, military, economic cooperation with Israel, very, very warm and tight tourist relations, uh, energy trading, gas trading, specifically water trading. Israel has consistently helped uh, Turkey. This is a less pleasant chapter of the history to uh, deny the cause of the Armenian genocide in the United States. So it's been a very, very close political alliance. Last year, uh, a Turkish-sponsored uh, group of ships or flotillas uh, sailed towards Gaza in order to challenge the Israeli blockade of Gaza. Uh, the Israeli naval commandos uh, took over the flotilla. In one of the ships of that flotilla, the Avi Marmara, there was uh, pretty significant resistance to the Israelis with uh, cold weapons. And uh, in an exchange that the details of which are not completely clear, uh, the Israelis opened fire and nine Turkish citizens on the Avi Marmara were killed. The United Nations investigated the killings recently and concluded that Israel's blockade on Gaza was legal, but that its uh, response to that Israel's blockade was legal, that the Israeli soldiers were in fact attacked on the Avi Marmara, but their response and the way that they tried to take over the ship was completely disproportionate and in violation of the laws of war as a response. Uh, so it sort of distributed the blame between the Israelis and the Turkish NGO that had sent the ship. Be that as it way, the Turkish government required that Israel apologize for its takeover and killing of the Turkish sailors. Uh, Israel refused to do that. Turkey kicked out Israel's diplomatic staff from Turkey, and that relationship has, for now at least, uh, suffered significantly. Some reports have Turkey turning off the friend identification systems in their uh, airplanes, NATO institutes. Turkey is a member of NATO, Tur NATO institutes systems uh, in their airplanes that will um, not enable it to fire on uh, friendly airplanes. Uh, supposedly, Turkey has taken out Israel from the computer program of friendly airplanes. Whether or not that's true is hard to say. Uh, I've read it uh, from pretty credible sources. If it is true, it's uh, a sort of a striking indicator of how bad this, uh, this relationship uh, has become. Moving to the fourth piece of the puzzle, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian relations. The last couple of months have been dominated by the Palestinian bid for uh, statehood at the United Nations. Uh, that bid was carried through several weeks ago. There was a widespread expectations. There were widespread expectations that once the Palestinian speech was made in the United Nations, uh, the dramatic speech by Chairman Abbas, that widespread Violence would break out in the West Bank in Gaza. Uh, that never happened. And um, in fact, the aftermath, or at least so far the aftermath of the Palestinian statehood bid has been um, somewhat anticlimactic. Uh, Palestinians scored an important moral victory in some quarters, uh, although the umbrella organization of uh, peacemakers, the, the, the quartet and the Americans, obviously um, this being an election year didn't uh, didn't uh, very seriously uh, support it. It's not clear if that uh, if that bid is going anywhere. Essentially, what looks like is set to happen is that it will either be tabled, shelved in committee, or vetoed by the United Nations Security Council, in which uh, the United States has a veto vote. More dramatically, perhaps, in the last few days, the Israelis made. Uh, an incredible exchange deal uh, with the Hamas that was holding one of its soldiers for the last five years. And the details of that exchange deal, which is supposed to take place tomorrow, is that in return for the Israeli soldier being released, 1,027 Palestinian prisoners from Israeli prisons will be released as well, many of them who were involved in uh, 
uh, famous traumatic uh, incidents of uh, killing inside Israel. Finally, the internal piece of the puzzle, the domestic piece of the puzzle, as far as Israel is concerned, is that for the first time uh, this past summer, for the first time in many, many decades, Israel has had very, very significant social unrest. Take the Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Boston, Occupy movement, and multiply it many, many, many times over and increase its legitimacy to cover much of the political spectrum, and you get the picture. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there were, a few weeks ago, there were 300,000 demonstrators in Tel Aviv. Given percentages of population, that's, Israel has 7.5 million people, that's pretty much analogous to 12 or 13 million people uh, demonstrating in uh, New York City. So if you can imagine something like that happening, that was the uh, impact on Israel. And the aftermath of that has been dramatic as well. Uh, the government appointed a special committee to examine the claims of the demonstrators. The claims of the demonstrators had to do with inequality and in income distribution. They had to do with uh, unavailability of houses because of government policies that artificially decreased the supply of housing. They had to do with special government subsidies to ultra-Orthodox Jews uh, who didn't serve in the army. And they had to do with a regressive tax system. And the government, which is a right-wing, neoliberal, very conservative government, was so shocked, coalition government, which was, by the way, voted into power by the votes of some of these special interests that were being protested against, was so shocked by the protests that it ordered the National Committee of Inquiry. The National Committee of Inquiry very quickly recommended a series of social democratic reforms that would essentially push Israel socially from the direction of the United States to the direction of Norway in a very short time. And uh, it's recommended, and this is one of the most unnoticed, remarkable moments in recent histo Israeli history, actually in all of Israeli history, those recommendations were rammed through by this very, very conservative Israeli government and passed a cabinet vote, and now are waiting to pass a parliament vote. And, the re and furthermore, this commission um, also recommended that the budgetary sources for making these changes should come from Israel's military, military and security budget, which is also unheard of in Israeli history. So if that actually happens, that will be a gigantic uh, watershed. So these are the several most significant, I think, pieces of the puzzle as far as the current Israeli situation. Um, now, for, for the practical question, how, how, how does Israel, at least partly, uh, dig out of this? I thought the title was catchy, and I was hoping that it would bring some of you here. Uh, I'm not completely sure that it does dig out of this. I, I, I'm, I'm committed to the first part of the title, more, to the sec more than to the second part of the title. And I think that it does historically happen that nations get stuck. For, for a while. Japan has been economically stuck for over 10 years, for example. We will probably be stuck for a while, too. I do think that there are some things, some significant things, uh, though, that Israel um, can do. Look, obviously the major issue that Israel is facing is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It has been for a while. It overshadows everything else. And it's a very, very strange kind of situation. There's, on both sides of this conflict, I was told not to walk around, but I can't help it. Is that okay? Yeah? Well, if I bend, does it? Okay. Uh, the, on both populations, there's consistently about 50% of the people depending on who gets killed when, it's a little more or less, a little less than 50% of the people that support a two-state solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians. This has been the case for about 20 years now. Furthermore, the outlines of this two-state solution have also been clear for a very long time. 
They've been suggested by the Arab League. They've been suggested by an Israeli initiative. They've been suggested by George Bush. They've been suggested by Obama, who got a lot of flack for it, even though he didn't make it up. They've been suggested again and again. And they're pretty much this. Israel would return to its pre-1967 borders, which would mean a retreat from most of its West Bank uh, settlements. The settlements that are right next to the western part of its capital, Jerusalem, uh, would be annexed into Israel. In return, Israel would give territories somewhere else in equivalent size to the Palestinians. Its capital, Jerusalem, would be divided between East and West Jerusalem. The Palestinians would agree that there would be no actual practical so-called right of return, namely that Palestinian refugees would not get to go back into Israel and um, unbalance its Jewish majority. And this is the consensus view of what a two-state solution uh, would look like. And at different points in the last 20 years, both the Israelis and the Palestinians agreed to that. Unfortunately, there wasn't one point in which they both agreed to it. Um, so after something doesn't happen for almost 20 years, in spite of a not insignificant um, degree of support for it, you begin to suspect that maybe it's not going to happen for a while longer. And for the Israelis, uh, at least, there has been a tendency to self-righteously say there have been several instances in the past where we have made maximalist offers or we were forced to make maximalist offers or were committed to these maximalist offers. They were rejected. The Palestinians won't recognize us as the home state of the Jews. They won't give us a paper that says the conflict is over. And the alternative to that, therefore, is to be at war. And this is, in some ways, an example of the war peace dichotomy that Pedro talked about in his introductory remarks. Um, so what I'd like to explore with you for a moment has to do with the pessimistic assumption. The pessimistic assumption being, let's imagine that indeed the two-state solution, this maximalist happy two-state solution is not in the cards. Is the war-peace dichotomy justified? Does that justify this sort of all-or-nothing logic that has been um, dominating the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I think it doesn't. And I think Israel in 2005, led by Ariel Sharon, who has since had a stroke, had an interesting reversal. Now, Ariel Sharon has a very interesting, well, interesting is a euphemism. Ariel Sharon has a very, very problematic history. Ariel Sharon started his career famously as a war criminal. Uh, one of the most famous war crimes that he was responsible for was in the early 80s, when Israel was at war uh, in, with the PLO in uh, southern Lebanon, uh, standing aside while uh, uh, Christian militias slaughtered thousands and thousands of people uh, in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. And Israel had a very good inkling of what would happen uh, once the Christian militias went into uh, the refugee camps and decided that that was okay, that they would uh, provide a degree of cover for this. Um, and Sharon, for many, many years, was the boogeyman of uh, Israeli politics. I actually remember uh, growing up as a kid the mantra uh, in our house was that once Sharon becomes elected prime minister, we'll move to America. Um, and then remarkably, in 2003, if memory serves, Sharon did become elected, uh, no, before 2003. I think it was late 2001. but. I, I, I'm blanking on the exact date. Sharon did become elected, uh, did become elected prime minister, and uh, w went through a pragmatic uh, transformation, perhaps only preceded in the 20th century by uh, the likes of Churchill and de Gaulle. Uh, 
Churchill, by the way, we usually remember him for the, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them on the landing posts and so on, speeches, uh, was a first-rate uh, colonial killer uh, before, he was, before he became Churchill. Um, Sharon realized that what Israel was doing wasn't sustainable anymore, probably politically and practically more than morally, which I don't think was a category that meant a great deal to him. And he decided to begin the separation process of Israel and Palestine. And if uh, that separation process couldn't happen, um, if that separation process couldn't happen in agreement, then to begin it unilaterally. And in 2005, he pulled up all of Israel's uh, settlements from the Gaza Strip and became the first Israeli prime minister to ever remove an Israeli settlement. Not the Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, Rabin, who was murdered in 1995 by an Israeli extremist. Not the Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, Shimon Peres, the great dove of Israeli politics, but actually the former war criminal uh, Ariel Sharon. And it seemed like the direction that he was going in was that that would, would have been a test balloon. And had the test balloon uh, been successful, um, he would have uh, removed more settlements, first from the Northern West Bank and possibly later from more of the Central West Bank. But he got a brain hemorrhage, and Israel was, became historically uh, unlucky with a well-meaning, intelligent, but completely untested uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Olmert, uh, who went on a catastrophic war, lost it, and with it, much of the chances of uh, making peace after that. Now, one claim about Israeli unilateralism is that it generated a great motivation on the Palestinian side to push, to try to get from Israel by means of force what it what they were not able to get by means of negotiation. And it was as a result, the Gaza withdrawal was seen as a disaster. I hold the, I guess, somewhat controversial position that the problem with the Israeli unilateral withdrawal is not that it was too uh, big, but rather that it was too small. And that Israel had a very strong interest, even if there was nobody to talk to, to remove as many settlements as it could with or without negotiation in order to decrease the amount of friction that it had with the Palestinians and to say, here's what can be removed, here's what can be removed unilaterally, and here's what's going to stay until uh, there's negotiating uh, to be done. So one thing Israel could unilaterally do is decrease the amount of Palestinians that actually wake up and see Israeli APCs and tanks outside their windows. There are isolated settlements in the north of the West Bank that cost a lot of money to defend uh, that have nothing to do with the mainstream views of Israelis uh, and that could be removed, sending a powerful uh, political signal. That's one form of unilateralism uh, that the Israelis uh, can be engaged in. It wouldn't leave Israel without bargaining chips because they wouldn't remove themselves from the ones that can't be removed without negotiation. It would just leave them with less bargaining chips but also with less problems. So I'm not sure it's a terrible deal. What else can be done as part of Israeli unilateralism? And again, all of these suggestions are based on the pessimistic assumption that a two-state solution, a two-state deal is impossible at the time and are meant to sort of destabilize this assumption that if a comprehensive two-state solution can't be had, then nothing can be done and you have to uh, brace for war. That has been the uncreative problem that the Israelis and the Palestinians have had for so long. The other thing that Israel could do powerfully is to reform the status of its own Israeli-Arab minority. 20% of Israel's actual population of Israeli citizens, not Palestinians living in the West Bank, not Palestinians living in Gaza, but Israelis of Arab descent who have Israeli citizenship as Muslim Arabs, all right? This 20% is, for all intents and purposes, a group of second-class citizens. 
their educational opportunities, their work opportunities, their uh, social mobility opportunities are all uh, significantly lower than the Jewish part of the population. For many, many years, most Israelis uh, have acknowledged that this is a problem and have promised to reform this. It's never been done. Reforming the status of Israeli Arabs, generating real equality, or moving towards real equality between Israeli Arabs uh, and Israeli Jews would also send a powerful signal to the Arab world that Israel is serious in its uh, intentions to end the state of belligerence with the Arab world. Um, would also set it up as an example of a real democracy rather than as a democracy just for Jews. That's something that can be done without any price vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, because these people are citizens of the state and not Palestinians. It hasn't been done. Finally, there's going to be a prisoner exchange tomorrow, uh, as I had uh, said a few moments ago. And in that prisoner exchange, that really highlights Israel's strategic fragility. And um, 1,027 Palestinians, as I mentioned, will be uh, released uh, in return for one Israeli soldier. You can't imagine the kind of debate that this has sparked in Israel. It's an impossible dilemma. Israel is the place where the most insane lifeboat ethics dilemmas come into very dramatic and real uh, existence. Whose interest do you prefer, that poor guy who's been in prison for five years? Um, do you let him go, even though that means giving up the interest in retributive justice of the families of the people who the released uh, prisoners, uh, prisoners uh, had killed, and some of these had been uh, the people who planned and sent and orchestrated suicide bombings in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and my own hometown of Haifa that have killed hundreds and hundreds of Israelis? Or do you sacrifice the future interests of people who are going to die by the return of at least some of these prisoners who historically do return to uh, terrorist activities? I'm very happy that I had nothing to do with this decision because it's an, imp it's an impossible decision to make. Uh, one thing is curious, though. In Israeli prisons, among, with these, among these 1,027 people is also a gentleman by the name of Marwan Baraguti. Marwan Baraguti was the rising hope of the Fatah organization, the successor to Arafat, and a peace activist uh, for many, many years, uh, one of the staunch young supporters of the Oslo Accords. When the second intifada started, Marwan Baraguti, the peace activist, uh, turned into a war activist, and. Uh, uh, coordinated uh, some of the fighting with Israel and coordinated uh, some of the attacks on Israeli civilians as well. Since he's been in prison, he's uh, returned to promoting from prison a political solution. The man is one of the few people on the Palestinian street who has actual overarching widespread credibility. We've let loose some of the worst murderers that have killed Israelis in the last 50 years. But Maran Baraguti is staying in prison. Unilaterally releasing Maran Baraguti outside of this deal to say, OK, Hamas, you didn't even ask for it, but as a gesture of goodwill, we're releasing him, would have been a remarkable move and would have bolstered moderates on the Palestinian side. But that wasn't done. And that's just a set of examples of what unilaterally could be done. I have a little quote for you here from George Kennan's uh, famous uh, X article. And George Kennan found himself writing on a situation that was, at least in some respects, structurally similar. And Kennan said, what do you do with a set of circumstances where there's intractable ideological amnity that's not going to be resolved. Does that kind of intractable ideological amnity, like the Israelis have with the Hamas, for example, have to mean paralysis? And Kennan, who's usually credited with 
inventing containment, even though the version of containment that he invented had very little with the, to do with the version of containment that he that was implemented. The version of containment that was implemented was hijacked by uh, the semi and later fully insane Forrestal. Uh, Kennan talked largely about cultural containment, and very eloquently in his X article. Kennan was Ken, <laughs> I have to tell you this story. Kennan was a philosopher. The, I mean, he was a historian of international relations, but he was a philosopher by, by, by training and inclination. And uh, he was sitting in the embassy in Moscow in the late 40s, and uh, the State Department asked him why Russia was refusing to, why Soviet Russia was refusing to join the World Bank. And like every good philosopher, he was asked one question, and he answered another question giving a very, very long cultural analysis of the sources of Soviet conduct. And um, he wrote this up. He sat two days writing this up. And when he finished writing it up, he brought it over to the secretary in the embassy and said, please uh, telegraph this uh, to Washington. And it was 4.30. And she was supposed to finish work at 5 and had a date. Actually, and he said, "No, no, no date. You have to, you have to send this today to to Washington." So, so the date waited, and he sent this document over. Uh, it was known as the Long Telegram, which it literally was, and it made such a splash in Washington that he was, uh, everybody was made to read it, and it was um, actually um, reshaped into an essay in Foreign Affairs called "The Sources of Soviet Conduct." And what Kennan argued in this essay was that in these cases of intractable ideological enmity, the best thing that you can do rather than say there's nothing to do is to become the best possible example of yourself and hope that the marketplace of ideas, as it were, would choose the better rather than the worse example. And let's, let me just read the excerpt uh, that's uh, on your handout. It would be an exaggeration to say that American behavior, unassisted and alone, could exercise the power of life and death over the communist movement and bring about the early fall of Soviet power in Russia. But the United States has in its power to increase enormously the strains under which Soviet policy must operate to force upon the Kremlin a far greater degree of moderation and circumspection than it has had to observe in recent years, and in this way to promote tendencies which much eventually which must eventually find their outlet in either the breakup or the gradual mellowing of Soviet power. For no mystical messianic movement, and particularly not that of the Kremlin, can face frustration indefinitely without eventually adjusting itself in one way or another to the logic of that state of affairs. Thus, the decision will really fall in large measure in this country itself. The issue of Soviet-American relations is, in essence, a test of the overall worth of the United States as a nation among nations. To avoid destruction, the United States need only measure up to its best traditions and prove itself worthy of preservation as a great nation. Surely there was never a fairer test of national quality than this. In the light of these circumstances, the thoughtful observer of Russian-American relations will find no cause for complaint in the Kremlin's challenge to American society. He will rather experience a certain gratitude to a providence which, by providing the American people with, the, with this implacable challenge, has made their entire security as a nation dependent on their pulling themselves together and accepting the responsibilities of moral and political leadership that history plainly intended them to bear. So, the first suggestion then is this kind of containment inspired, real containment inspired unilateralism of Israel trying to become the best example of itself, taking its claims for being the only democracy in the Middle East seriously. If you're the only, democ if you're the only democracy in the Middle East, dem democracies take their bearings from the moral legitimacy of their principles. Well, at least that's what they're supposed to do. The second point is perhaps an explanation of why Israel is behaving like it is behaving, more than a recommendation, and an explanation that will also tell you something about the limits of what Israel can do. This deal, I'm hearing from American friends, some version or other of what the hell are you doing with this Shalit guy? Who lets one soldier out for 1,027 prisoners with blood on their hands? Um, and in fact, by the way, 
a quick test. Uh, there's an American prisoner in uh, Taliban custody for several years, an American soldier that has been in Taliban custody in Afghanistan for several years. Does anyone know his name in the room? Juan, are you a service member of the prison? Yeah, except for our ROTC soldier. Does anyone know this guy's name? No. Well, shockingly, in Israel, the whole country feels that this kid is related to them. Now, whether that's some form of weird version of leaning to fascism or whether much more charitably, as the New York Times put it, it's an expression of a culture of solidarity, make your own decision. But it's, it's, it, it, it's a striking fact. It's a striking fact that there has been no serious public campaign in this country to free this gentleman from Taliban captivity, which I'm sure is not pleasant, uh, and that most people have never heard of him. And I can't imagine President Obama emptying out Guantanamo Bay for any reason, not the least in order to bring this guy back. Well, that's essentially what the Israelis did. They didn't empty out their prison, prisons. There's 9,000 more. Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prison, but it's a pretty striking deal. Now, how does this happen? And why, and this is a connected question, even though it doesn't sound connected, why did a right-wing neoliberal, super-conservative, Thatcherist Israeli government assent to the most dramatic set of uh, social democratic offers and proposals in Israel's history in the course of two weeks? after being elected on a completely different platform. And the reason is that Israel is the size of New Jersey. Everybody knows everybody else. There's seven million people or seven and a half million people in it with only four million or so that fully participate in its political life. Most of those people know each other uh, in one way or another. The Brad Pitt five degrees of separation is turned usually into three degrees of separation uh, in Israel. And um, it's a country that makes remarkable demands on its people. It's a country that requires every young man and woman to go into the army. Men between three and four uh, years. I spent four years in the Israeli infantry. And then requires them to stay in the army uh, <clears throat> for a month every year until the age of 45. And this army is also, to this day, and that's the reason why Arabs are not allowed, Israeli Arabs are not allowed to serve in it, the main vehicle of progress in Israeli society, the main vehicle of upward mobility, the main old boys network, uh, and so on and so forth. What the Ivy League school are here, the army uh, is in Israel. Now, a country that makes these kind of requirements on its citizens that asks for a great deal from its citizens cannot send people into military service and then tell them that it won't do everything that it can to let them go. Because it's not a volunteer army. It's not an army that is unfamiliar to most of the population as it is here. It's a militia. It actually and truly is a militia. It's a largely reserve army. In fact, the way Israel is designed is for its regular forces that number around half a million to last and to last between 24 and 48 hours, and because you know why? Because that's the time it call it takes to take to, to call up the reserve the reserves and mobilize them. So, under those circumstances, there's a very different argument about prisoner exchanges. One, namely, you do what you can. And everybody's watching, and everybody cares very, very deeply. And everybody has a picture of this guy uh, in their house. And in fact, lots of my Israeli friends' emails have a, you know how people put little signatures uh, on the bottom of their emails? Have a free Gilad Shalit thing on the bottom of their email instead of a, instead of a signature. And number two, a country that lives like that, that lives, and that's why I put the Being Sparta headline on your handout, a country that has that level of Spartan requirements from its people, there's only so far that it can go in being um, neoliberal. There's only so far in which can, it can really, really accept gigantic gaps of wealth 
the rugged individualist ethos that exists here, to whatever degree it exists, isn't rooted in anything in Israeli society. The last 15 years, it got a boost by the economic success. With the economic success game, came wider gap between the rich and the poor, and then people in the middle class said, wait a minute, we give three to four years of our best years of youth to the army, another month, many of us every year to reserve service. We have a highest taxation rate in the West, above 50% to fund the military machine, and then we can't buy an apartment, or then we, uh, our universal health care is essentially non-existent, we can't pay for daycare. So when you have those kind of pressures, you can't have neoliberalism, even if you believe in its virtues. And in fact, Israel, as a result of that and nothing else, is moving away from it. There's no Keynesian revival in Israel. Nobody, know who's, no, nobody really knows who Keynes is. It's not about that. It's not about a belief that these are the kind of macroeconomics that are required for Israel to flourish, because it has flourished uh, on <laughs> Hayekian uh, policies until now. That's what's underlying it. So I have a little quote here from the beginning of Rousseau's um, Discourse on the Origin of Inequality. The, Rousseau begins the Discourse on the Origins of Inequality with a love letter to Geneva, which was probably written for political reasons more than anything else. But it's a beautiful love letter in which he describes a fictional Geneva. And this line uh, struck me as especially appropriated. Geneva was a city-state in which all the individuals being well known to one another, neither the secret machinations of vice nor the modesty of virtue should be able to escape the notice and judgment of the public, and in which the pleasant custom of seeing and knowing one another should make the love of country rather a love of the citizens than that of the soil. As it was stated much more precisely and cynically by Israel's legendary foreign minister, Abba Evan, many years ago, Israel is a shtetl with a nuclear bomb. Uh, and under those circumstances, you don't, do new, you don't do neoliberal and you don't leave prisoners behind, to be very uh, simplistic uh, about that. Finally, and I'll stop with that and uh, would be happy to discuss with you, um, what should we make of the Arab Spring, strategically speaking? Uh, if the Arab Spring does turn into a democratic spring, there's powerful empirical evidence from the last 200 years that democracies don't fight each other. In 1795, Kant writes perpetual peace um, in response to European balance of powers politics that he's uh, witnessing and uh, comes up with a beautifully articulated cosmopolitan ideal of what it would take to um, end wars, not just in a truce, but really once and for all. And uh, among the three so-called definitive articles or three principles that he uh, notes is that all countries should become Republican, that the constitution of all countries should become Republican. And what he means by that is pretty close, comfortably close to um, something like what we think of as liberal democracies today. Constitutional regimes with separation of power, with um, uh, officials who are uh, elected uh, in a proportionate fashion and who are held responsible by their constituents. And Kant's point is that in a republic, in a liberal democracy, unlike in any other regime, the people themselves have a stake uh, in what the country ends up doing, and as a result, are more careful to go to war. Are more, his word is hesitate. They hesitate to go to war because they're going to actually have to pay its price. So they hesitate in the degree of belligerence of the people they choose. This was overly optimistic. What seems to have happened, however, is that democracies for 200 years have not gone to war with each other. But they do go to war actually more frequently than non-democracies against undemocratic countries. So Kant was half right, empirically speaking. But it's a remarkable uh, finding. Democracies have established a, a separate peace among themselves. And there has almost, there has been almost no example in the last, uh, 200 years of a liberal democracy fighting another liberal democracy, or of an emerging liberal democracy fighting another one. So if you want to do any betting, I would bet that the Israelis and the Turks will be mad at each other for a while, but actually won't go to war, because it's almost unprecedented historically. So this should be great news 
right? Because if there's a democratic spring uh, in the Arab world, then the scope of the democratic peace will, will be increased. Uh, here I want to... I think it's too early to tell, is the truth. Democracies aren't exclusively, aren't even primarily based on the written laws and the written constitutions, but the way in which those institutions have attachments, psychological attachments, traditional attachments to the populations, what kind of legitimacy they have, how much people are actually committed to them. And that takes time, and it's gonna be very, very hard to know how people are gonna be committed to them. And Burke writes his famous reflections on the French Revolution as a letter to a French friend. And um, the French friend is enthusiastic, as many, many of us are, about the revolutions uh, in the Arab world. Uh, I'm sorry, about the, uh, uh, is as enthusiastic about the French Revolution as many of us are about the revolutions in the Arab world. And Burke writes to him the following. When I see the spirit of liberty in action, I see a strong principle at work. And this, for a while, is all I can possibly know of it. The wild gas, the fixed air, is plainly broke loose. But we ought to suspend our judgment until the first effervescence is a little subsided, till the liquor is cleared, and until we see something deeper than the agitation of the troubled and the frothy surface. I must be tolerably sure before venture publicly to congratulate men on a blessing that they have really received one. Flattery corrupts both the receiver and the giver, and adulation is not of more service to the people than to kings. I should therefore suspend my congratulations on the new liberty of France until I was informed how it had been combined with government, with public force, with the obedience, with the discipline and the obedience of armies, with the collection of an effective and well-distributed revenue, with the solidity for property, with the peace and order, with civil and social manners. All these in their way are good things too. And without them, liberty is not a benefit while it lasts and is not likely to continue long. The effect of liberty to individuals is that they may do what they please. We ought to see what it will please them to do before we risk congratulations, which may soon be turned into complaints. Let me stop there. Um, and thank you very much for listening with such patience and uh, welcome you to ask any questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, What's your name? David Phil. David, yeah. I'm just curious, you didn't mention it here, but I guess what your opinion of Iran is and how it kind of fits into this. I know it's not really the Arab world, but they've had a really pugnacious attitude towards Israel. And you talk about democracies not fighting each other, but I really wouldn't consider Iran too much of a democracy. No, I wouldn't either. I don't I, I see it complicating them. They're affecting the rest of the Arab world, even though they are Muslim and they're not Arab. Right. Iran so far has been uh, conducting its um, anti-Israeli policy by proxy, and it has had two proxies. Uh, one has been Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, uh, and uh, the other has been uh, Hamas, which is a somewhat more uh, reluctant proxy than uh, Hezbollah is. Now, the Arab world in general, and this is part of the uncertainty, I think, uh, that is appropriate to apply from uh, Burke's text is at a point in which it's torn between a more pragmatic form of political organization and a more Iranian-inspired one. And I think that this is a historical process that, to be honest, Israel doesn't have a lot to do with and the United States doesn't have a lot to do with. The contribution can be to subtly tactfully bolster the more progressive part of it and wait it out. Um, Israel is at a, Israel, I mean look, with Israel's, with Jewish history, it's a little bit scary to not take seriously a country in which at least some significant constituents regularly declare their uh, intention to destroy Israel regularly deny the Holocaust and openly claim that they're building nuclear weapons. Uh, 
That being said, life and political life involve risk, and sometimes very substantive risk. There's very little that Israel can do. It's not at all clear. It's, in fact, very far from clear that Israel can land effectively a preemptive strike against Iraq. Most war games that have been conducted on this, not that war games are a very good predictor of what can be done, but they're the only thing that we have, have been inconclusive. What is probably going to be quite conclusive is that this will spark a very, very significant regional conflagration in the area. So under that risk calculation, the best I can say is um, essentially what's being done now. The pretty rigorous attempts at containment. Um, is that satisfying? I just, I don't know if there's no. a solution to that, or is that something that's going to be there for a long time? No, I think that's something that's going to be there for a very long time. And political survival requires um, prudence and competence and also a great degree of luck. The main reason why uh, there was uh, no nuclear war in the there are several reasons why there was no nuclear war in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but as many of the players consistently admit, one of them was a lot of luck. Thank you. Other questions? This Israeli government doesn't. This Israeli government is largely reactive. The first brave policy move that it took was in fact deciding about this prisoner swap. Everything else that it has done, including the historic adoption um, of uh, these social democratic uh, reforms, has been forced on it. Uh, so this is, in that sense, the answer to the first part uh, is no. As for the United States, um, I think under some circumstances it would have been in Israel's best interest to be pressured more significantly by the United States on very specific issues. For example, I think Israel's credibility would have been infinitely increased by being forced to implement a freeze on the building of new settlements, since all of them are being built on a territory that is being disputed. Right between, I mean, regardless of considerations of international law for a minute, it's actually this territory. I mean, if, if you're fighting with somebody about something, then basic decency is you don't make changes on that something until the fight is resolved. And if you do, you signal to the other side that you don't want to resolve the fight. Now, that's the way the settlements largely got built by uh, the so called uh, facts on the ground uh, policy. This isn't necessarily a fact and or force of nature. It doesn't have to be. Uh, the United States guarantees most of Israel's loans. Once in the past, Secretary of State Baker has said, if you don't do what we say, we're not going to guarantee your loans anymore, and you won't get them. And Shamir, who was Israeli prime minister in the early 80s, said, you won't dare to do that for reasons that we both understand, Mr. Secretary. Then Baker got mad and he did do it. And then Israel froze its settlement activities for a while. Uh, I think that could be useful. Uh, I don't even think it would have a gigantic political cost. I don't, I don't buy that axiom either. The military establishment in the United States strongly thinks that to be the case as well. What I just articulated was articulated by every important American general. And if President Obama decided to do that, he would just have to march them out in front of the cameras and say it. And then uh, the political cost would be minimized. Yes, sir. When you, when you talk about um, the US and the Israeli uh, relationship, you know, which is clearly very close. Uh -huh. 
I think it would benefit the U.S. to be more independent of Israel. Either way. Well, that's a big difference. But yeah, yeah, I think our interests are very close, but they're not identical. And I think Israel is not always the best judge of its own interests. The governments who were competent at judging its own interests were usually very weak politically. The governments who are strong and survivable politically are usually not very good judges of Israel's best interest. So I think that some pressure, even if the pressure was limited, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is probably the most historically conflict, complicated live conflict that is still raging. I, I by no means think that it's exclusively, at this point, even primarily Israel's fault, that it's still alive. Nevertheless, Israel is, has been, at least for the last several years, a very poor reader of its own national interest. For example, these recent, from a few days ago, declarations, decisions to begin the building of new settlement neighborhoods uh, on the outskirts of Jerusalem, so clearly a sort of reprimand to the Palestinian president for unilaterally declaring statehood. Uh, but they completely destroy the chance of any progress in negotiations, even if there is some. So there I think that the, the U.S. should have put its foot down. Uh, but I think that requires more political resoluteness than is here. Um, yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. Right. And do very well to build yeah. the security walls around Jerusalem. The um, end of the intifadas, the security situation is much improved. The economy is much in, has been much improved. Right. And essentially, one has a sense, or I can ask you, you have a sense that the Palestinian problem has become, to many Israelis, at least sort of irrelevant to everyday right. life. I wonder whether the Arab Spring and the ch changing situation of Israel within the international community not to mention the, the current unrest for in terms of civil and economic issues in Israel, will not change the equation for Israelis themselves, that, that we will see going forward a greater need of Israel to think about its best interests in, 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 in the broader term. Yeah, well, I think you said more articulately the main guest of my, of my talk. So I think that that was true. And I think that the calculation, so in other words, this sort of isolationism behind the wall, at least for a while, was plausible. It became less plausible internally because it seems like a small slice of Israeli society was the main beneficiary uh, of the, uh, the isolationism. So there was a push in that direction. And then there was the destabilizing uh, from the rest of the Arab world that said, all right, now all of these quiet borders that we could have taken for granted uh, won't be quiet anymore. And uh, finally, there's also uh, the demographic uh, question. And that is continuing uh, to tick. And as, as it continues to tick away, and there are, I mean, Israel effectively, except for the Gaza Strip, controls all of the area between the Mediterranean and the River Jordan. Uh, we're moving very close to a situation where there's a tie between the amount of Jews and the amount of uh, non-Jews in that area. In 20 years from now, as people will continue to, uh, you know, as it were, even if nothing changed, sit quietly and uh, enjoy their isolation, there will be a significant majority of non-Jews being controlled by Jews between the Mediterranean and the River Jordan. And then all of the apartheid analogies will uh, become all of a sudden more apt and countries actually historically do run into problems once even a pretense of legitimacy is, is, uh, is undermined. So, yeah. Yes, sir. You discussed before that the, uh, the 19, going back to 1967 war, the agreement was agreed upon by both sides at a certain point. Right. And now but, you still can't find what you do. What do you think the primary block is now? Because now they're petitioning 
right. I guess there's a couple of, uh, well, there historically have been a couple of blockades. From the Palestinian side, there has been a blockade about the right of return uh, in which uh, there was a resistance to formally give that up. So in 1948, when Israel was created after war with several Arab armies, 600,000 Palestinians became displaced. There's still historical disagreement about how exactly they became displaced. Part of them were displaced by direct ethnic cleansing by the Israelis. Part of them ran away. Part of them were encouraged to leave by um, several Arab governments uh, that promised them better conditions upon their return. This is still a matter of great debate. But one thing was clear. When the 48 war was over, 600,000 Palestinian Arabs who had been living in their towns and villages were not anymore and uh, their place was largely taken uh, by Jews. And uh, since then, a main Palestinian claim has been the people who were displaced all those years ago and their children and their children's children should be allowed to return to the houses. The Israeli answer has been, one, we didn't start that war, we accepted the UN resolution that divided the country, our neighbors didn't, and we won the war, and this is what happens in wars. And two, regardless of the legitimacy, it's kind of a lawyer's argument, even if the first claim is not true, I love those, even if the first claim uh, isn't true, you can't solve this problem without victimizing a new generation of innocent people, right? Because there's now a third generation of children that were born into those houses. And mainly, the Israelis see right of return as code for uh, turning Israel into a non-Jewish state, right? Because if you'd have an influx of hundreds of thousands and of millions by now of Palestinian refugees, you would, um, uh, you would uh, upset the demographic balance between Jews and, un and, and, and non-Jews. So that's been one stumbling point. And as far, the way the Israelis have interpreted this, it goes back to um, Arab refusal to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And uh, that's very important uh, to the Israelis. Um, on the Israeli side, most recently, Benjamin Netanyahu has gone back on the agreement of several Israeli prime ministers, inc including uh, right-wing prime ministers, that a solution would have to go back to the 1967 borders, and says the 1967 borders uh, aren't tenable. And so that has shuffled uh, all the decks. So. To be completely honest, it seems like what's been happening in the last few years, more than actually wanting to reach any kind of solution, is playing a scoring points game in which you make an argument about who's to blame for the talks failing. And that's a weird kind of dynamics. You didn't ask this, but to just expand a little bit further, because you did ask about stumbling box. Um, Conflicts like this usually end with a combination of complete fatigue, remarkably uh, brave and visionary leadership, and remarkable uh, international pressure. We only have the first of those. So just historically speaking, these are when these kind of conflicts tend to peter out. And you know, fatigue, you rest a little bit, like we're resting now, and then you become you get an appetite for killing each other again, so even the first one isn't very stable. So that's what it takes, and that does take a lot of historical luck and a lot of character uh, on the part of the international community. And there's very little of that, and we're out of luck, and we're not even tired enough. So is this going anywhere soon? No, that's why I put so much, so much emphasis on unilateralism. I wish I could be more optimistic, but even though I'm a philosopher, I'm not a bullshitter. Yes, ma'am. Yeah.
Right. How do you start to address the issues within the country itself and within the citizenry? Well, you know, until this year, historically what's happened is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been the Tylenol, if you want, that kind of suppressed all of these symptoms. And the remarkable thing about this year has been that that Tylenol has uh, stopped working. Um, at least insofar as the relationship between the different uh, sections of the Jewish community in Israel uh, are concerned. And so these are the issues that came to the front in this summer of social pro protests, exactly those kind of questions about what benefits the ultra-Orthodox get and so on and so forth. Uh, the only ones who haven't been beneficiaries of these um, demonstrations over the summer, which again were completely unprecedented uh, were the Israeli Arabs. And that's why one of my recommendations was to uh, unilaterally uh, empower them. Uh, so they haven't really been empowered. Uh, and that conversation hasn't started yet. And I think it should start. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much.